I am so excited to introduce my guest, Russell Robinson of Jewish National Fund. Hi, Russell. How are you? Hi, Dana. How are you? Amazing. Russell, do you remember how we met? So I'm trying to to remember. You know, it's a good question. I think that you made uh, on, on LinkedIn. You, made, you got it. You made a connection with me. And uh uh, then you even related on that connection something with a friend who was looking for one of the programs that we were offering. Absolutely. And that connection, then we uh, met and got together. And it was amazing to me that it was 2018 that we first connected. Right. And from the moment we met, I had a special place in my heart for you. And yesterday when we had breakfast, we just talked about everything. You had never been to Pershing Square, which is one of my favorite places. They have my soy latte, which is decaf, of course. We wouldn't want to see me on caffeine. And we just talked about everything. One thing I love about you is you sit down and say, what's going on with you? And it is so rare that people actually want to hear and listen and encourage others. And they just talk about themselves all the time. And every time that I've sat down with you, it's always, what's going on with you? We talked about my business. We talked about how I've never been to Israel. You always ask me the same question, when am I getting to Israel? And that has to happen, it's on my bucket list. But we talked about my daughter and you gave me just incredible advice and I wanna thank you for that. Well, first off, I, I think that, you know, uh, um, Keep incredible people that you get to meet and get to know is one of the, the fascinations of of being in this kind of a business environment and world. And you talk about LinkedIn and, and meeting and networking. Um, if you if you open up your mind and if you opened up the opportunities, you get to meet incredible people like yourself mm -hmm. and, and follow the story and, and you get to meet people and, and you learn. Uh, so I just asking you questions. I learned so much for myself as well. So I thank you for being uh, a part of my life. I'm just looking over here at one of the most incredible things that I found out that I didn't know about you, that you were recently selected number 40 on the Jerusalem's top 50 most influ influential Jews of 2022. So thank you so much for joining me. And can you tell me a little bit about that? I listen. I'm very fortunate that I had the opportunity in this in 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 my in my profession, um, and I, we were talking earlier before we got on air about I grew up in a small town, in El Paso, Texas. So you know, when you're in El Paso, Texas, to think that you're going to be able to meet presidents and prime ministers and and influence and change lives and do things, you know, it's uh, um, you're you're in a parochial, you know, uh, provincial little place, and 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 you have to, you know, have great imagination. I think there, I was lucky enough. Uh, I think uh, worked hard, but lucky enough to have those opportunities. So being selected is about really the organization that I represent, the Jewish National Fund USA, gives me the opportunity to represent six hundred thousand contributors, uh, making a difference uh, in Israel mm -hmm. in people's lives. Uh, in education, in uh, in uh, social programming, in environment, in in water resources, and uh, so being able to, you know, almost carry the 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 bag for six hundred thousand philanthropic investors gives you that opportunity to to have that kind of uh, of uh, uh, ability to change the world and. So I'm lucky that I have that. I, I feel very lucky about it. And I feel responsible as a person delivering philanthropy because I think it's one of the most important, precious responsibilities that somebody has is taking somebody's philanthropic. And in Judaism, there's no word for charity. It's called responsibility. It's a daka. And even when somebody travels, you, you usually give them money so that they could be your shaliach, your representative to deliver that tzedakah to you, the place of your um, uh, travels. And that means that you'll go in safety because you'll be protected. So I take that responsibility very seriously and, and being nominated by Jerusalem Post and being selected uh, influential, it really is that I just get to represent 600,000 uh, people that are uh, uh, allow me to be their influencer. 
That's absolutely incredible. And one of the things we talked about yesterday at breakfast was how when I have clients that are nonprofits and I'm helping them to solve their technology challenges, I get very involved in their fundraising and that's my passion. We become either honorees or on the fundraising committee. And we had talked about how difficult it is sometimes for nonprofits to find those type of partners, whether you're having a gala or you're having a lunch and learn or whatever it is and how important it is to not just find a vendor, but to find a partner that is going to support your cause. And we spent a lot of time on that yesterday. And that must be something that nonprofits sometimes struggle with, knowing, well, we're getting great service from them, from a level of service and the products that they provide, but they're not really supporting our mission. So that must be something difficult that your team has to deal with on a regular basis. Well, I think that first off, nonprofits have to look at themselves as a business. So if you represent yourself as a business, look at uh, you got a, a stadium that could be named Citibank. It's not named Citibank because they love Citibank or don't love Citibank. It's because Citibank made a contribution to have that stadium named after them for the period of time, AT&T Stadium, whatever it may be. So businesses run this way. So nonprofits can run this way. Now, that also means that you have to uh, um, you have a responsibility on both sides. If you have a vendor, I think it's absolutely within your not only your your right or responsibility to say to that vendor, listen, I, I'm not telling you not to make a profit. Everybody should make their money. Um, I make mm -hmm. I make a salary. I have no problem people making money. Uh, but as a vendor of our nonprofit, we want you to participate with us. Uh, towards our mission. And one of the things that you do, Dana, not just for the Jewish National Fund, I know from you, you as a provider of service also provide much greater opportunities, networking opportunities. You've introduced me to people. Uh, uh, you've contributed. Uh, you've been honorees for other organizations and, and you're out there uh, to your circle of influence to be involved. So beyond just giving service, you also are a partner into that. And I think that nonprofits have to look at vendors in that way. It's not, you don't have to uh, put up some sort of wall because, uh, uh, well, they're a vendor. And so I don't want to talk to them. But if you feel, first off, it's an important uh, mission that your organization is, uh, you know, I don't know what that percentage, what that dollar is, but there's something that's a participation to it. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to hold it again. So, you know, Dana, you, you, you took the, the, you have the, the 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 business and so we want x amount of percent no we want dana to be a participant and that's something that you have been part of everything that you do i think that's why people want to do business with you and want to be part of you it's not because they're getting a thousand dollars from you because let's face it it's not going to make or break the organization uh, but it does say to the organization that you're in the game with them not only in providing great service, but you're in the game and believing who they are as a mission. And the organization could say to you, hey, we believe in your product and we also want you to believe in our organization. Amazing. We have such interesting conversations. You and I could sit for hours and hours, breakfast, lunch, dinner, drinks, although I drink water. But I am absolutely shocked by the next one. You are the youngest CEO in your organization in the 100 plus year history. Is that, that was, true? That was 26 years ago when I was young. <laughs> that was so um, bad. Uh, so, you know, look at, I think that the world's changed uh, from 26 years ago when I did uh, become the, the chief executive of the organization. Uh, I think that, uh, it was the world always looked at, uh, you know, if you weren't 50 plus or 55 plus, you know, you weren't ready for prime time. Uh, and, and, and I think that the next generation is going to change things around even faster. I think that you're going to have people who are uh, 30 years old and 25. So it's not a matter of age. It's a matter of, of who they are. And, and our world has changed also that that uh, uh, people younger than me, uh, they have such a view of the world. Uh, and get to see the world and, and are part of it. Yeah, part of it is because of Instagram and, and social media and all those things that we have available to us, but they travel and do things and, and experience. And, and uh, so it's, it was, 
as a CEO, I learned uh, that, you know, when you are the number one, there's an awesome mm -hmm. responsibility of people's lives, not only for what your mission, your organization, you're hiring and firing individuals. It's a big responsibility. Um, and, but, uh, you know, then I was the youngest. Now I'm not so young, but I, I try to oh, stop it. But I still believe in, uh, I, I, in all my heart, one of the greatest things I think about, I could say about our organization, a lot of things, but the fastest growing part of our donor demographic is our 22 to 40 year olds. Um, and so people who are contributing, and I think that anybody wants to talk about tomorrow's generation in any negative way, they're wrong. Tomorrow's generation is better than ours. Not yours, you're still in that young generation. <laughs> Thank you. So we talked a little bit yesterday about the hybrid environment and your thoughts on the hybrid environment. It's how many years later, and here I am in my home in Westchester, having a podcast with you, working from my kitchen, because I'm like, okay, when am I going back to Manhattan? And what are your thoughts on the hybrid situation? So now you're going to take me and make me sound old because it's not what the young people want to hear. Stop look, it. I think that, look, at we were in as an organization before COVID, um, we made certain business decisions anyway. We had offices all around the country. We still have offices around the country. We took our administrative offices and collapsed them from some 57 different small offices and, and, and an administration person here or an event programming person here, marketing person there. And we collapsed them into four main administrative offices. So you could have an office in Denver, but your administrative office was Van Nuys, California, or you could be an office in uh, uh, Austin, uh, Texas, but your administrative office was in Chicago. So we had done that before COVID to take away the administrative and the, what I call the square footages of offices. Now, you have to build a corporate culture. Now, remember, sometimes of our offices is one person in Seattle, um, and it can yeah. be seven people in Denver. But you've got to build a corporate, cor corporate culture that understands who is everybody, because if you're building a team, you've got to build a team that everybody has to know that everybody is uh, uh, dependent upon everybody else. So we were doing that before COVID. COVID came. Now everybody is virtual and there's so many people that are virtual. There are positions that could be done anywhere where organizations and companies are going to start making decisions is New York or Los Angeles, Chicago, whatever the high end living places are. Uh, you have to pay more for salaries. Well, if I'm going to pay more for salary for somebody in New York, then I have an office. If I have square footage that I'm paying for, hybrid, it sounds so easy. But right. you know what? If you're coming in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but not Thursday, Friday, and now you're going to come in Mondays and Fridays, your desk is still your desk. I don't get to sublet your desk out for two days and and then you got somebody working next to you. They're chose Wednesdays and Thursdays to be off. So you haven't even, you you have this operation. You're trying to build a corporate culture, but even the people that are coming in hybrid aren't even building it because they're not even coming in at the same time. So companies are going to be making decisions. Now, young people, I say that, want to have those kind of um uh, work-life balances. And, and let's face it, as a salesperson, Dana, you can work out of your home. Your your ability to uh, show results is based upon a simple formula. Are you selling or are you not selling? Okay, it's not how many times you're in the office. But your dependency still is the repair people, the people that are servicing the clients for the different things and your relationship with your own people working out of your home in Westchester, uh, you know, doesn't allow you to have those kind of quick, you know, close or Long Island, your close relationships. So you're missing that in the corporate culture. Absolutely. I think that we're the problem with hybrid is this. If you have an office, you're in the office. If you don't have an office and you can do your work from outside, then there should not be an office available to you. And then you got to start coming up with how does Dana come together once every week or two weeks? And what are the kinds of, of um, you know, made up, um, uh, when I say made up opportunities for sharing uh, stories? Because let's face it, the coffee 
uh, uh, area, sometimes is the greatest builder of a, of a corporate culture. Uh, so tell me about your daughter, Dana. So tell me what's going on. And then she says, listen, I have a client. I'm, I'm having a problem because a client has told me that he has this or, or or she has this. And 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 I don't, oh, well, you know what? I had a client just like that, Dana. Let me tell you, that little coffee conversation mm -hmm. helps your business. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a tough decision. It's very interesting that you use the word salesperson and you may laugh, think this is funny, not think it's funny. The vice president of my company and I were with a potential new client having lunch about a week or two ago. And one of the people at the table said, Dana Karen is by far the best salesperson that I've ever met in any industry. And I said, I'm insulted. And they said, what part of that could you possibly be insulted by? I said, I don't sell, I solve. And they just stopped. And I said, I'm sorry, but the person, salesperson to me, sales executive, just has a negative connotation in my mind. And I branded myself as the solutionist, like everyone knows. My digital business card is the solutionist. My background on most of my Virtual meetings is the solutionist. And one of the things I think you've done so phenomenal is branding yourself. And that's what I pride myself on as well. So my next question to you is, how can people follow you? How can people find out more about Jewish National Fund? Obviously, after hearing all about you and how incredible the organization is, they're going to want to get involved. They're going to want to make a difference. How is the best way for someone after this podcast to hear more about you and Jewish National Fund? So uh, thank you. I And first off, if you think salesperson, try to use the title fundraiser, you know, because that has a whole... Uh, <laughs> connotation as well, but I I always believe that I don't have to sell anybody anything. We talked about it yesterday. Uh, you just have to help people buy. Um, that and that's where your solution is that you have branded yourself. That it's a if they contacted you, if you've gotten to see them, it's now a matter of helping them buy, not selling them anything. So um, and and it's coming, but but they can go to jnf.org to our website. Uh, we have a YouTube page, a Jewish National Fund the USA on YouTube, and we have a lot of different videos. We've had television series, YouTube television series. On Facebook, please, if you friend me, I'll friend you back, and uh, uh, and my Instagram, and and I do it myself, my LinkedIn, and and that's why I answer uh, uh, Dana and others because I believe in it. I, you know, when people take the time, and and there's any sort of a connection, in, so I think you can learn from Dana you know, had to make a connection as well, because if it just like contact me, I'm Dana, I would have not contacted you, but Dana used, oh, and by the way, I see you have Mus High School in Israel, and I have a friend who's a teenager thinking about going on the program, and, and you know what, so that makes the relationship that part of the conversation solution is that you talk about, so go on my LinkedIn and or Instagram, go on to our YouTube page and, and watch, I just think that uh, and and as an organization, what we try to pride ourselves on is that we don't we do vision, not projects. Hmm. Uh, we we try to set objectives. Under objectives are a thousand projects hmm. to do. But what's the rippling effect? What is it that you're trying to do? And then allow people to be part of this great adventure, the adventure that is out there. Uh, because that's what life is. Nobody, you know, life is 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 too regimented, you know, and, and you know, so be part of the great excitement of life and change life. Be it with Jewish National Fund, who I happen to think does great work, but do it. Uh, if it's not with Jewish National Fund, somebody, but if you're not going to be above yourself, if you're not going to be, if you just want to sit on the bench of life, uh, you're going to miss out on a lot. Get involved and, and be involved and do. And like your friend uh, who sent their uh, teenager to our high school in Israel for 18 weeks, took a semester abroad during 16, yes. 17 years old. Uh, they become much better students in college and, and life experiences. And then when I bother Dana about when she's going to go to Israel, come on a trip <laughs> and, and see the reality <laughs> of real Israel. And uh, we'd love to show it to you. That would be incredible. So I'm looking at my last question before we wrap up this incredible podcast. And I'm so grateful to have you in my life and honored that you were my guest. If there's one key message or suggestion that you can leave our audience with, what would that be? Leadership. 
the whole world depends on people leaving. Now, I, I tell this story, Dana, because I and sometimes people take it the wrong way. This world is, to me, very simple. It's made of evil or good. <laughs> and evil has leadership. That's how they get people to follow them to do evil. And good, sometimes we don't have enough leaders. And the vacuum that has to be filled, that either evil will fill it or good will fill it, is based upon leadership. And people follow, and there's more followers than there are leaders. But if you're a leader, take leadership, get off the couch, get off the sidelines, be involved and do things. Uh, if you're going to do it within your company, if you're going to do it in life, do it within philanthropic world, do it within politics, but lead and lead for the good and not for the evil and leave evil out of it because that's my word to everybody. The world is only filled full of evil because good people are not leading enough. So lead, 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 make the world a better place. It's amazing that you talk about good because I always say during Christmas, they always talk about the elf on the shelf and throughout the whole year, I refer to you as the mensch on the bench. So it is just incredible that we wrap this up talking about doing good in the world because that's exactly what a mensch does. And Russell Robinson, this has been incredible for me. I hope it was enjoyable for you. And I cannot thank you enough. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity and for allowing me to be in uh, your life and your experiences and your journey. And uh, let's go to Israel. Woo we're going to make it happen. All right. Have an amazing day. Thank you. Thank you.